Good morning, I'm Muriel Bowser. I'm the mayor of Washington, D.C. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, we are here in the Marion Berry Building uh, to provide a briefing uh, to D.C. residents on the district's response to COVID-19. Uh, today, I'm joined by the city administrator for Washington, D.C., Kevin Donahue, uh, and Dr. Nesbitt, uh, the district's doctor and director of D.C. Health. Uh, today, we're going to be giving you an update on how uh, we have been driving down cases and what that means for our winter action plan. Uh, we put in place in December to uh, address Omicron. Uh, but first, I'm just going to ask Dr. Nesbitt to briefly uh, mention uh, our current metrics. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, on our first slide, you'll note that we have uh, for you the COVID-19 metrics that we routinely show. Uh, our six key metrics that are posted every day on coronavirus.dc.gov. Uh, you will note that five of the six key metrics are improving. Uh, the one metric where we see uh, some declining over the uh, past seven days is our key metric where the individuals that we are contacting uh, for uh, contact tracing uh, are not uh, responding as we would like. So it's just a reminder for uh, everyone to answer the call. Uh, it's not unusual for people to uh, not respond or to slow their response times to us uh, when they sense that things are getting better uh, in the community. But the best way for us to continue to slow the spread of COVID-19 is for us to be able to get people to continue to participate uh, in contact tracing uh, when we reach out to them. So uh, just a reminder again, folks, to answer the call. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Nesbitt. Uh, and uh, just a quick reminder of the winter surge interventions that um, we put in place. I included expanded testing, uh, and reinstatement of a mask requirement, uh, instituting uh, a vaccine requirement for DC government workers and eliminating a test out option. Uh, we've opened COVID centers across all eight wards as well as uh, distributed uh, and early, early on a rapid test um, and required a DCPS uh, test to return from winter break. Uh, we continue to remind DC residents of all the things that they could do to stop the spread. Uh, and we instituted a vaccine requirement um, for select indoor venues across the district. Uh, and because of um, that diligence, uh, we have seen uh, since the height of Omicron uh, wave uh, entered the district in December, cases have dropped more than 90% and there has been a 95% reduction uh, in hospitalizations. Uh, and we're in a much better place now uh, to announce adjustments to um, that winter action plan. Uh, first, uh, the expiration of the indoor mask mandate will happen on February 28th. And as of March 1st, um, the district's indoor mask requirements uh, will be um, by, dialed back. Uh, you, of course, know that DC Health will maintain uh, its advisories according uh, to the level of spread. And you can go uh, to coronavirus.dc.gov uh, on any given day to find out what that level uh, of spread is. Uh, so, uh, to be more specific, masks will not be required at uh, restaurants and bars or sports and entertainment venues, gyms and rec centers, houses of worship, businesses, grocery stores, pharmacies, uh, retail establishments, and D.C. government offices uh, with no public interaction. Uh, masks will still be required uh, at any private business that requires the use of masks uh, and puts up signage to that effect. Masks will still be required at schools, child care facilities and libraries, congregate facilities, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, shelters, dorms, and correctional facilities, health care and medical facilities, public transit, taxis, and rideshare vehicles, 
and DC government facilities with direct interaction between employees and the public. As an example, our DMV service centers and DHS service centers to name two. Additionally, um, beginning tomorrow, February 15th, um, as you know, the public health emerge, the limited public health emergency that I put in effect in December um, expires, uh, as will the requirement for indoor venues uh, to verify that patrons are vaccinated. Uh, again, businesses may choose to keep vaccination requirements in their place, in place um, at their establishment um, with appropriate signage. We uh, in DC Health and Dr. Nesbitt have um, highlighted the importance of boosters. We will continue as a government uh, to do everything that we can uh, related to edu public education uh, and access to booster shots, easy, free access to booster shots at our COVID centers. Uh, and so I wanted Dr. Nesbitt just to put in her word about how boosters have helped um, during this Omicron wave. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, it's extremely important for everyone to understand how highly effective our vaccines remain. Uh, we have approved vaccines in the U.S. that have demonstrated to be safe and effective uh, and continue to provide us a degree of protection uh, from the spread of COVID-19 as well as from uh, risk things such as visits to emergency rooms and urgent care as well as hospitalizations. Uh, we wanted to be able to show you all uh, this chart um, that the CDC has published. They have an, a couple other ones that show some of the benefits of getting boosted. Uh, this one here shows how well boosters uh, provide you additional benefit uh, against not only the Delta variant, uh, but in these important times where over 95% of the circulating COVID-19 virus is the Omicron variant. And you can see there, uh, that if you've been vaccinated in the last six months and you're what we consider to be fully vaccinated, meaning you've had two doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, your vaccine is providing you 81, we consider it to be 81% uh, protective or you, decreases your chances by 81% that you'll end up in the hospital. Uh, after six months uh, of having those two doses of vaccine, uh, that protection decreases to 57%, reducing your risk by 57%. But when you get your booster, that third dose, it increases your protection back up to 90%, even higher than it was uh, in your initial fully vaccinated phase. So this is extremely important and why we want everyone to get a booster as soon as you are eligible, which means after five months after receiving your second dose of either the first Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. So it's extremely important for our community to understand uh, the importance of getting boosted. Another way on the next slide to show the importance of getting boosted, when we look at deaths uh, in the U.S., um, looking at individuals who are unvaccinated, uh, they are 97 times more likely uh, to die from COVID-19 than individuals who have a booster. Uh, and even when we look at individuals who have been fully vaccinated or what we call having the primary series of vaccine, they are 14 times more likely uh, to die from COVID-19. Uh, so it's extremely important again for, for you all to get boosted. And we've got a long way to go uh, in the District of Columbia. Uh, you can see here um, that only about 20% or so of our population has got 23% of our fully vaccinated population that's eligible uh, for a vaccine has gotten boosted. Uh, we have over 50, around 50% of our seniors over 65 have gotten boosted, uh, but we know that most of the hospitalizations that are happening in individuals who are fully vaccinated are happening uh, for people who are over the age of 65. So it's extremely important to move from being not only fully vaccinated, but being boosted uh, when your uh, five months is up. So please, please, please go out and get your booster. As the mayor mentioned, as part of our winter surge plan, uh, we opened a host of COVID centers in all eight wards across the District of Columbia. Those uh, COVID centers um, will give you your first dose, your second dose, and your booster. Uh, and we have those COVID centers that are open 
seven days a week, every day of the week, there's a COVID center that is open and they have very flexible hours on any on given days of the week. Uh, they will be some will be open as late as 9 p.m. to make sure that we can accommodate the needs of our families. Um, and also, this is an opportunity to uh, just notify you all that because our COVID service centers are full service, uh, meaning that they, they offer uh, you an opportunity to pick up a PCR test, a rapid antigen test, as well as getting vaccinated, uh, that we will be transitioning from our firehouse testing a program that has been operating since 2020. And that program will sunset on Saturday, February 26th. Uh, so again, please, please, please avail yourself of our COVID service centers for your vaccination and testing needs. Uh, and we look forward to being able to serve you in all eight wards of the District of Columbia. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, and uh, a reminder, switching a little bit from COVID uh, to talk about the budget season, the city administrator and our budget team and cabinet members have um, been working diligently for the last several months to formulate a balanced um, budget. Uh, and a big, big part of that process is me hearing directly from DC residents. Last week I had our annual um, telephone town hall with DC seniors, 5,000 people um, called in and stayed on the phone for an hour and watched on Facebook and watched on channel 16. Um, so we invite you to also uh, watch live and participate at the budget town, citywide budget town hall at budget.dc.gov. Uh, the call, the uh, program starts at 6 p.m. and you again can watch, participate virtually uh, by going to budget.dc.gov. Uh, but please RSVP um, prior to that. Uh, also at budget.dc.gov um, to learn more. Uh, we're also very proud uh, to open, uh, I should say, to break the ground this week at St. Elizabeth's East. Uh, I will be joined by um, the team at Universal Health Services, George Washington University, Children's National Hospital, uh, uh, our DC government team and honored guests for the groundbreaking and naming of the new hospital uh, at St. Elizabeth's. We're obviously very proud um, that we have made this progress, uh, and this is a big, big investment uh, in the healthcare system uh, for, for the district. So with that, um, we'll answer your questions. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning. Uh, you've mentioned in the past that you'll dial up and dial back restrictions as needed depending on the course of the virus, but can you explain to people watching you right now or reading the Washington Post what goes into a decision to rescind these restrictions, which have been um, some of the most important ones, I guess you would say, over the course of this Omicron variant? Well, I think I've explained that, Michael, that we, uh, went into the the winter and especially Omicron, which hit us probably mid to um, going into the third week of December. Uh, we put these measures in place. We've seen a precipitous drop uh, in the case levels uh, for for Omicron. And um, this is this is where we've landed. Any specific data point or metric you're looking at? I know I've asked this before, but as a barometer for saying we're ready to cut this off right now. Um, well, we shared with you the metrics that we follow um, and that we follow uh, each and every day that our case rate um, in hospitalizations uh, and the vaccinations, um, the percent of those vaccinated, uh, especially when I talk about hospitalizations, um, that are COVID cases. Can you talk about, we saw the Omicron variant came right after you first dialed back the indoor mask mandate. Is there any concern, maybe Dr. Nesby, you could talk about this, about you know, what could happen next? Is it, is it too soon to make a move like this when the virus has proven to be so unpredictable? Well, your question is what? Is there any concern that this could be a premature move considering how unpredictable this virus has proven to be? 
Um, I, it's not, and what we know is that we have to be nimble um, if something should change, like it changed in December with a new, very contagious variant. Um, I don't think any of us can say here that there won't be other variants that would require us to do something different. Um, so just like when Omicron uh, presented itself, uh, we uh, adjusted our approach. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Mayor. Katie Barlow from Fox 5. On Thursday, during a, an ABRA hearing about the big board's liquor license, Dr. Anil Mangla said during his testimony for that hearing that we were, quote, nowhere near where we needed to be to lift the mandates, looking at a number of 33.1 cases per 100,000 in his presentation that day, and said that the goal was to get to minimal community spread, which was fewer than five cases per 100,000 to lift the mandate. So what changed between Thursday and today? Um, I can't speak to what, what he was referring to. So is that inaccurate or, or did something, have the, have the numbers gone down significantly since Thursday? The numbers have been reported since Thursday. So I'm not exactly, if, if Dr. Manglev made that statement, it was his, it was his opinion of, of the mandate, not the city's. Yes. Um, House Republicans apparently, uh, there's a story I read about House Republicans saying that, um, well, when they take over, that, that's the way it was put uh, in uh, November, that they were, that basically things were going to change around here. They're, I guess, going to give you a lot more oversight. Uh, they complained, uh, I guess, to some degree about the mass mandates, about the crime. You've heard of this story, I'm sure. What, what's your reaction? Sam, I, I, I'm focused on Washington, D.C., and my job as mayor is to work with whoever's in the Congress. Um, and the truth is we've worked with Democrats and Republicans on a number of issues, uh, and that will be our approach, um, regardless of who's in charge. Okay. Yes. Uh, so just a couple of follow-ups on, on, you know, the ending of these restrictions. Will you scale back any of the testing sites? Yes, we will, um, the firehouse testing um, will, we won't have the firehouse testing sites after February 26, as we mentioned, um, but that is um, replaced by the COVID centers across the city. So will there still be the opportunity for people to get the at-home PCR tests at the libraries and drop those off and also get the at-home rapid test kits? Will those still be available? Yes, currently. We haven't rolled those back, but we will obviously be watching what the demand is. And then for students in DC public schools, they'll still be required to wear masks at schools. Will there still be the vaccine? Will there still, there will still be a vaccine requirement for students and will there still be a testing requirement for students, the pre-K requirement every weekend and then the, the spring break requirement, will that still remain in place? All yes, of those? so we, um, Mask, let me just be perfectly clear. There's no change to mask requirements in our schools, child care facilities, libraries, and a whole list of other um, congregate facilities, as, as I mentioned. Uh, we've had no change to our testing protocols. First of all, our asymptomatic, test, asymptomatic testing protocols across our schools where we're um, aiming to hit 30% of the kids tested weekly. Um, and there is no change currently on the weekly pre-K uh, testing or the intent to test across the schools um, after winter break. Um, and then we will, we, will be, we will monitor what we need to do post spring break. And the vaccine requirement for DC government employees and DC healthcare workers, do those remain in? Those remain in place. And as does, I didn't answer um, fully, uh, as does the mandate for children, which is legislated, as you know, um, and mandated by the council. And so let me ask you, what do you say to people, and we're already seeing on social media, you know, some people are applauding this, other people are saying, this was the only thing that made me feel safe about going out in the district. And then back to the big board, what do you say to a business that is defending its right to stay open and now you're, you know, because they pushed back on this and now you're 
going to remove this mandate starting tomorrow. Will the city go forward with uh, punitive action against Big Board? As I understand it, Mark, um, Big Board is still in the process with ABRA, um, and that process will play itself out. I don't know all of the details, um, but Big Board was found to violate our requirements, and now those requirements um, will, will be changing, um, first with the, the vaccine requirements and then uh, with the mask requirements. I will say um, we, we look very closely at uh, our levels of vaccination. We did see at the height of Omicron with a lot of attention on Omicron, vaccine mandates going in place, more people going out um, to get vaccinated. Um, but we've also seen those numbers start to decline. Um, so we, we do believe that we've gotten the, the push out of the vaccine requirement um, for indoor venues that we're going to get. Uh, COVID question. Is this going to be the last uh, regularly scheduled situational update? Or, or are you prepared now to just put this behind you, put COVID behind and, and move forward and focus on other things? Or will we still be getting these situational updates? You'll get them as we need them, in which we, we've kind of been in that posture since last summer, Mark. Um, and I, I don't know that we've done them weekly since then, but we've done them as, as we need to do them. And I'm, I'm prepared to do that. So we've done COVID and we've done everything else for the last two years. Um, and that's what we, how we in, intend to move forward. And so I've, I've learned, we've all learned that this virus can reappear, come back in a different form, require a different response. Um, but we are committed to communicating what we know, when we know it, and the things that we need D.C. residents and businesses to do to keep us all safe. Yes. Uh, for the city administrator, I understand the uh, first uh, day of enforcement for the government vaccine mandate is starting tomorrow. Is that correct? Or is that the first day, sorry, they're supposed to upload their status? Uh, tomorrow is the day when people sh are required to be fully compliant. So that means they've had the full two course um, vaccine uh, regimen and if they're qualified for a booster based on time, have a booster as well. Okay, so ha what's the percentage of uh, workers who have uploaded their status so far? Um, the uploaded status, um, uh, there's about, well, I, the upload, I, um, I want to get you afterwards, Ashley. I, I do come with some data. The number that have uploaded it is, I expect it's going to change today and tomorrow when the deadline goes into effect. Okay. Uh, the, the numbers haven't fundamentally changed since we talked, uh, I think, a week or two ago, which is when we begin discipline, as I've said, we typically start with individuals who've, not, who've chosen not to engage at all in the process, right. and that number remains about 1,500 employees. Okay, and then do you have, you said you have other data. Uh, is there anything new with our exemption requests? Nothing's changed fundamentally since we last talked, so it's roughly the same number of requests. I would expect um, end of last week, today and tomorrow, for additional requests to come in, uh, as what typically happens when the deadline comes. Okay, we've had a number of these requests pending for some time with both the licensed healthcare professional professionals and government workers. Is there a timeline at this point for those to be uh, approved or denied? Uh, uh, I, think you'll st I think we'll start to see more movement on the resolution of those in the next week or two. Um, we have been watch the attorneys that work on this have been watching cases nationally to have a good understanding of what the right balance is when reviewing an exemption request. So I would expect to see the exemption request numbers uh, change more dramatically in the next week or two than they have, say, between today and the last time we talked. Okay, thanks. Mark, Sam, and tell me your name again. Katie. Katie, okay. Mark, Just Sam, Just following Katie. up on that, uh, Mr. City Administrator, or actually maybe for, for you, Dr. Nesbitt, uh, it seems like with the request, the request, the data that we've been provided as far as the religious and medical exemptions, it seems like you're working through the process, whoever's actually doing these, working through the process with DC government employees. But when we look at the numbers for healthcare workers, not DC government employees, doctors, nurses, and whatnot, 
there doesn't seem to be the same speed or movement in those requests. It just seems like the vast majority of those are just still pending and haven't been ruled on one way or another. And I'm wondering why those aren't moving at the same rate as the DC government employee requests are moving for whoever is in charge of that daily rate. Um, I, I mean, since I am, I'll, I'll um, uh, weigh in and Dr. Nesbitt can add if she cares to. The, um, uh, the thing I'd, I'd highlight is that the reason why, certainly to my knowledge, things uh, are pending for what seems like a while is that uh, we are, as I said before, we're on legally uncharted territories. Not that vaccine religious exemption requests are new, but the volume and nature of them is fundamentally different. Uh, so it's been very helpful to make sure we have a clean process uh, and that different viewpoints of attorneys, and attorneys do have different viewpoints on the issue, have the time to look at uh, cases progressing elsewhere uh, and to make sure we have consensus before starting to issue exemptions in any large number. Uh, and healthcare exemptions are also, keep in mind, of employees of a different, inherently different profession than, say, uh, a worker that it works at the office of planning uh, that sits at a cubicle all day. Uh, so there are all differences in the nature of jobs that also factor into whether or not uh, the extent to which one can accommodate uh, a request for an exemption. Okay. Mayor so Bowser, I have two just off topic for you. One, uh, do you have any comment on former MPD Lieutenant Brett Parsons, uh, who was a central figure here in DC in, in your department with the gay and lesbian liaison, uh, was arrested in Florida. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Have you been briefed on this? Um, only briefly. Um, and so I don't know, I don't really know enough to comment about it. Brett was a, a great officer and um, I, I know that the, whatever department there is gonna fully investigate it. And then can I ask you about Gambit? Uh, yesterday, one of the busiest days for sports betting uh, the, the district sports betting app for Apple users went down two hours before the Super Bowl and apparently has not come back up online. Do you, do you know how, how that happened? What are your thoughts on that? And to all the people who have pointed to this no bid contract and have had problems with this from the beginning who are now saying, you know, we told you so. What, what do you say about this? I mean, I really think that uh, that's a conversation I have to have with the CFO. I think you know that the independent chief financial officer for the district uh, manages that contract, um, and I'm going to have to get some answers from them. What, what, what are you looking for? I mean, are you, what have you been told? And, and again, just to the I haven't actually, they haven't briefed me at all. Um, and so I expect to get that explanation. Obviously, if we're going to have uh, any system uh, in, in, in the government, uh, including for sports betting, people will have different opinions about sports betting. Uh, it should work, and it should especially work on the biggest sports day of the year. Um, and so I will be looking for that explanation. I expect that the council um, that has oversight over the contract and, uh, you know, and how it works will also be looking into it. Thank you. So, Mayor, I was just interested in uh, tolerance for COVID. I guess we're almost like two years into this. Mm -hmm. And just uh, as I think last time I asked Dr. Nesbitt or, or you gave some information, it was that basically um, even with the drop in the Omicron variant, still the number of COVID cases was higher than at the peak before. And I noticed that a number of states are getting, you know, uh, despite the numbers, are sort of, uh, let's say, you know, getting rid of various mandates. Um, is there a greater tolerance now for this? That's, that's my question. Well, the biggest difference is we have safe and effective vaccines, Sam. Um, and so COVID is not as deadly. Uh, as it was when, um, of course, last year this time. And so we need people to get vaccinated to save their lives and to make sure that the system can accommodate whatever this virus does. And so that's, that's, the, biggest, that's the biggest difference. Um, and so we also know that people who have been vaccinated um, and others 
are wanting to get back to their normal lives and know what they need to do uh, to keep themselves safe. But really getting vaccinated and boosted, we can't emphasize enough. Is it still higher now than it was at the peak before? Um, it's still above um, where we like it to be, um, which is, a, what, what is the term we're using? So, Substantial? Yes. So, you know, I'll, what I'll add to that is that from a public health perspective, um, ideally, we'd like us to have low to moderate transmission. And uh, as the mayor highlighted, as, the, as we shift from a mass, indoor mass mandate uh, in many of the environments, the DC Department of Health will continue to recommend through our mask advisory uh, that people continue to wear a mask indoors. The majority of people will still need to wear a mask indoors until we have low to moderate community transmission, right? And we'll provide you um, good metrics to help you understand that. Uh, so when you ask Sam, are we low enough? Are we where we need to be? Uh, we're really wanting people to be able to see the data, the information to understand that. Uh, and that's because we haven't had enough people go out and you know get their boosters to have that best protection uh, as we would like them to, uh, but we're getting there. Uh, a lot of the things that were put in place with the winter surge plan have been effective. As the mayor mentioned, we got a lot of movement uh, from that winter surge plan in the first three weeks from the announcements of the winter surge plan. We had over 50,000 uh, vaccinations given and over half of those vaccines were new people going out and getting their first dose of vaccine or getting their second dose because they hadn't finished their series. In the last couple of weeks, we've had that number go down to where 24,000 people or 24,000 vaccines were given. And a small purport, about half of those again, were people who were getting their first dose. But it wasn't that same boost, you know, of that 50,000 doses of vaccine being given in that three weeks when we really kicked off the winter surge plan. Uh, so it's always a good opportunity again for us to get people to, be, to remember that as the mayor said, vaccines are our most effective tool. They're safe, they're effective. They're what's going to keep you out of the hospital. It's what helps protect our health care resources so that we don't all have our hospitals overwhelmed uh, with people who have COVID and need to be on ventilators so that in the unlikely event or unfortunate event that we have someone having a heart attack, they can get the care that they need, right? Or if we have people who have to have surgeries that may require them to need a ventilator after their surgery, they can have those surgeries, right? So we have to be mindful that there are other healthcare needs in our community, and we wanna make sure that those things can take place and occur as well. Thank Quickly, uh, yep. Mayor, has there ever come a time where Dr. Nesbitt recommended that you boost something and you said, no, it'll be too disruptive to the community? Has Dr. Nesbitt asked me what? Has there ever been a time when Dr. Nesbitt, based on her, her health knowledge, recommended that you do something and you said, no, I don't think that'll be too disruptive to the community? I said no because I thought it would be too yes. disruptive. Yes. Uh, we followed DC Health's advice. Um, some things DC Health will advise and some things I will advise, uh, which is how I should have uh, answered uh, Katie's question a little bit earlier about the big board question and Dr. Nesbitt reminded me. Uh, Something and you said no. Um, I don't, maybe, I don't know, over the last two years. Yes. Two questions, Mayor. First, COVID related, second, off topic. For as you announced that you're lifting mask mandates, how are you determining um, what the metrics are for keeping masks on in schools right now? Well, that's a good question. Um, we continue um, to work with our school um, communities over what they think it will take um, to keep kids safe and in school. Um, we thought that. Our, our last group of little ones would be have access to the the vaccine in February. It turns out it's going to be um, sometime later. Um, so I I don't think that we're going to have a decision about schools anytime soon. And then off topic, um, when the Washington football team was still called the Redskins, you said that they would need to change the name if they ever wanted to move to the district. That name has changed now, uh, but the team still continues to grapple with internal 
problems, including recent allegations about the team owner, Dan Snyder, um, that came to light about allegations of sexual harassment, even potentially sexual assault. Uh, and you have said that there's a desire to bring the team here. Um, the name has changed, but a lot of the cultural issues they're still grappling with with the team. So can you, do you have a comment on um, still wanting to bring the team here despite all that's still ongoing? They're still owned by Dan Snyder and, and these new allegations are still surfacing uh, and they, as of today, appear not to be complying so far with congressional requests uh, into the, in, the internal investigation. Well, um, I, I, I can't say I've paid a lot of attention to, to that recently, other than to say um, we've always been focused on getting control of the land at RFK, uh, which we think the situation there is abysmal. Uh, we have a stadium that's falling down, surrounded by asphalt, when this city is in need of housing um, and other amenities. So we're very focused on that. Um, second, we have always been very clear um, that we want the Washington football team to play in Washington, and we um, will continue to pursue the best way um, to get there. Um, considering uh, an investigation happening at the Congress, we would uh, definitely um, not in, um, be supportive of anybody not answering the Congress's questions, especially on matters as serious um, as, as these allegations. Uh, I had the occasion to tell somebody uh, who really fought for the name change um, and the team owner then said, never, never um, would the name change, and we've seen the name change. Others have said, never, never will we see the culture change. Um, and so we know that these things can happen with the appropriate amount of pressure. Right, anything else? Thank you, team.